Happy Friday, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to a special Planetarium live stream this week. Uh, my name is Patrick Hess, your Planetarium specialist, and uh, hopefully we got some people tuning in because we're doing things a bit differently this week. We switched it up a little bit, um, mostly because uh, the Planetarium has been closed to the public this week for our annual uh, training and maintenance. Um, so uh, if you're uh, hoping to come to the Planetarium, then don't worry, we will reopen next week. But because our schedule's a little off, um, we were going to switch things up, and it has been a few months since we've done a Q&A live stream. Um, so I don't have any very specific plans for tonight. Uh, and this is all going to be about you, the audience. So if you have any questions or comments, you want to say hi, you want to have a conversation with me about space, you want to complain about Pluto, um, or you want to ask a question about space or any topic we've covered in the past, then please chime in the comments. Uh, and uh, we'll see uh, who tunes in. Um, just as a reminder, the Planetarium will be reopening next Thursday. We'll be open uh, on a Thursday through Sunday schedule. So if you'd like to come check out one of our live star tours, uh, of course, if you feel comfortable, um, we are following all of the uh, state and city mandated protocols for the pandemic. Um, so hopefully you feel comfortable with that. If not, of course, we're happy you're joining us here on the stream. But um, again, Thursday through Sunday, we will be open. We've got an exciting slate uh, planned. Uh, you may have noticed on our Facebook page that we are bringing back our laser shows. Right now we're going to do a matinee laser show at 4 p.m. Um, and uh, hopefully as things continue to open up and uh, we become less restricted, uh, we will uh, offer some evening laser shows. So if you want evening laser shows, let us know in the comments so we know to prioritize those. Um, because it's been quite a while since we've had our late night laser concerts. So I know, I know I definitely miss them. And if you guys miss them, let me know for sure. Um, so yeah, come check out the Planetarium uh, if you'd like. Uh, of course, that's a great way to support us. Uh, and all that we do, buying a ticket, and of course, watching our live streams is a great way to support us. If you're tuning in for the first time, welcome. Uh, and uh, we've been live streaming normally on Monday nights, um, but it has, uh, but occasionally we have um, uh, picked up a special live stream evening. We live stream on a Sunday a couple weeks ago, actually, for the Great Conjunction. Uh, and today we're going to do our Fan Friday live stream. Way, way back uh, early last year during um, the time when all of us were stuck at home, uh, we did live streams every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And Fridays were Fan Fridays where we did a QA. and a um, So if you have questions or comments, uh, be sure to put them in the comments. And we're doing a special Q&A live stream uh, now. The last time we did that was way back in September of last year. So... Hopefully we've got some people tuning in, asking and preparing some great questions. Uh, and if you have any other space fans or uh, people who just uh, want to complain about Pluto, then uh, share this uh, live stream with uh, them on Facebook. Also, as a reminder, if you are watching from Union Station's Facebook page, be sure to head on over to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page and give us a like there too, because we post all of our exciting space updates over there. Uh, and you'll uh, definitely, you don't want to miss any planetarium related news uh, that pops up on there first. Uh, and also as a reminder, you can find all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel. Just go to uh, YouTube and search for Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium and it will pop up there. Um, and if you're there, uh, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we need 100 subscribers to make it sort of official and verified. Uh, and so that would be an awesome way to end our live streams if we uh, get to that point. Um, so check that out. We've done so many amazing topics and exciting uh, topics. Just to name a few, we've covered pretty much every planet in the solar system at this point. Um, uh, some of them are getting their very own live stream. We've covered comets. We've covered minor planets. I put together a telescope in my living room. So if you want to learn about how telescopes work, then be sure to rewatch that live stream. We've talked about Hollywood astronomy. Uh, in fact, I'm planning on bringing that topic back here in a couple weeks. Um, the movie or the, the astronomy in the movies. Uh, and we've done TV astronomy as well. Talked about telescopes. Celestial Navigation, that was a very silly stream. I produced that uh, while I was on vacation, so it's a beach stream. So we've done quite a few of these. This is our 56th live stream. Um, so uh, there's a lot of cool stuff. If you uh, ha are just tuning in for the first time, uh, you can check back out. And we've already got someone commenting. Teresa says, how long is the Laser Show program? Great question, Teresa. Um, so uh, let's actually go ahead and bring up our schedule, and we can talk about that. Um, to start out with, Oop, that's the wrong website. <laughs> um, so uh, our matinee um, laser schedule is uh, going to be, uh, there we go, uh, is uh, going to change every week. So we're actually, right now we're gonna offer a different uh, special laser show on Thursday and Friday nights. Uh, and our first week will be Laser David Bowie. And that will be followed by Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd, a classic laser favorite. Uh, laser Michael Jackson after that. Laser Prince, following that, and then we've got uh, Beyonce, 
Queen, the Beatles, another classic Lasers of Oz, uh, the Wizard of Oz set to laser lights. Uh, and then our last one is Laser Stranger Things. And all these shows are generally about 40, 45 minutes long. Now, some of them vary. Some of them can be a little bit longer, but they're all under an hour, usually under 50 minutes. So uh, hopefully that answers your, your question, Teresa. Kathleen says, what are moon rocks made of? Are the elements found on the moon also found on Earth? Kathleen, that is such an awesome question. And I'm glad you brought that up because we uh, talked about that a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm trying to remember exactly when we talked about that. Uh, actually, uh, it popped up in the news because NASA uh, actually uh, announced or shared a brand new website that they created. Let's look it up here. Uh, NASA, I'll just search that. <laughs> um, all right, so yeah, so this is a brand new website that NASA just put together totally free online. Uh, it's called their Astro Materials 3D and it, 3D, sorry, and it has um, it has meteorite collections, but also Apollo collections. So you can actually look at all of the samples from the Apollo missions, and this will tell you all about those lunar samples, uh, Kathleen. And uh, and uh, to answer your question though, just very briefly, um, we have a name for the the dust on the surface of the moon. It's called regolith. Uh, and that just refers to sort of a very fine powdery uh, material. And there is some regolith found here on Earth, but it's less common. But most of the moon is covered in this uh, regolith. But a lot of the material uh, that make up the moon uh, is actually similar to the elements found here on Earth, um, which is one of the big reasons why we think the moon was actually created uh, when a very large object, probably about the size of Mars, crashed into the Earth um, at the beginning of our solar system's formation, and it carved off a chunk of the Earth, which eventually turned into the moon. Uh, and Kathleen, if you want to learn more about the moon, we did a live stream all about Earth's moon, and that was uh, on November 30th. So if you want to learn more about how the moon was formed and uh, what all those elements are, then be sure to check out that live stream. Uh, but hopefully that kind of answered your question. It's pretty similar to stuff we find here on Earth. And actually, let's, um, let's pull up... Uh, one of the programs that we use, Space Engine here. Uh, we were looking at uh, Pluto last, as you can see, but let's go over to uh, Earth's moon and we can take a look at its surface. Uh, we can see the light side of the moon over here. There is no far side, or, or sorry, there is no dark side or light side of the moon because uh, the moon experiences a day-night cycle just like the Earth does. Um, but there is a far side of the moon and a near side of the moon because one side of the moon always faces away from the Earth and the other side always faces towards the Earth. We call that being tidally locked. I mean, right now, uh, the moon is in a very new phase, so I'm gonna fast forward here to uh, reveal its other side in the light because I'm gonna show you these darker patches. Um, these are called maria, which means oceans, and our early observers who looked at the moon thought that these could have been oceans of liquid, but of course we know today there's no uh, oceans of liquid water on the moon. There is some water on the moon, but it's frozen. Um, but these are actually dried lake uh, lake beds of lava. Uh, so during the moon's formation, it was likely impacted by a lot of meteorites that were floating around in our solar system during the early days, and that exposed big oceans of lava that eventually cooled, and that's why those areas are flatter than the others. Um, so a lot of varied features on the moon. Uh, Kathleen. Awesome. We're getting a bunch of comments. That's so great. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, if you're just tu now tuning in, we are doing our Q&A live stream. It's a Fan Friday Q&A. Normally, we've been streaming on Mondays, but this one is all about you, so I don't have a specific plan today. Um, I am just going to answer your questions. I do also, I want to say that uh, my plan today um, was to also talk about some upcoming celestial events that are going to happen this year, uh, so exciting uh, events that you don't want to miss or space exploration events, too. Um, so uh, I'll try to fit those in. If you want to learn uh, about those, then comment in the comment section but for now it looks like we got a bunch of people tuning in sherry is watching hello sherry thanks for watching sherry asks will there be any more planet conjunctions coming up in 2021 and sherry read my mind we are on the same wavelength um so uh, let us check that out so there's a a great uh website uh called csky.org that um, is kind of my go-to that uh, has uh, astronomy calendars. Right now they go all the way to 2023. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. But this is uh, my usual go-to resource that has sort of a, a schedule of upcoming things. Uh, so let's check that out. Um, and uh, to answer your question, Sherry, uh, there actually is, and it's actually not on this calendar, um, there is sort of a conjunction happening right now, although we can't really see it. Um, so I'm going to actually switch gears again and go back over to Stellarium, which is our sort of planetarium software. Uh, and uh, 
if you uh, missed the Great Conjunction, um, uh, don't worry, we did a live stream all about it. Uh, but that was uh, an event where Jupiter and Saturn briefly aligned. They passed by one another and they appeared to line up. Of course, they're very separated by distance, but they looked very close together. And it's a rare event. It happens once every 20 years, um, although they got this close uh, for the first time in about 400 years, so that was exciting. But if you missed it, you'll see it again in 20 years. But um, I'm going to switch our horizon here. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are now setting, so they are going to be hard to spot at nighttime, if not impossible. But I wanted to point out here, and actually I might have to get a even flatter view, but right at sunset, there are actually three planets that are sort of lined up right now. Uh, and we have Jupiter and Saturn. I have to pause time here. Um, and let's... Uh, so we've got Jupiter up here. We have... Saturn right there. But then this third dot down here is Mercury. So we haven't really talked about Mercury in our night sky. I did a live stream on Mercury though, Mercury and Venus. Uh, that was back in October, October 12th. Uh, that was our solar system Inferno's live stream. Uh, but we haven't really uh, talked about Mercury. Mercury is actually a planet that is sometimes visible to the naked eye. Now it's harder to spot because it's uh, often very small and dim, but Mercury is actually sort of uh, close to Jupiter and Saturn right now. Um, so actually there's sort of one going on right now, Sherry. Um, but let's go back over to our uh, calendar of other events. Um, so this shows us when Mercury's greatest Eastern elongation is, and that's just a fun way of saying, that's the best time to look at Mercury, because that is when it's sort of highest in the sky. So later this month, if you do want to try to catch Mercury, again, that's a tough planet to see, but if you get some really good stargazing conditions far away from the city lights, away from light pollution, you might be able to spot it. January 24th will be one of the best nights to check it out. They also tell us the moon uh, schedule and the equinoxes. This will be uh, Mercury's greatest western elongation, and that is another good time to view Mercury. Mercury is so close to the sun that it uh, revolves around it very rapidly, so its elongations are very close together, if that makes sense. Um, there, Venus, the best time, will be in March. Venus has been absent from our, our skies for a little while, uh, but we'll be able to see this. Uh, Venus in the early morning sky before sunrise. Uh, we will call it the morning star. It's not a star, but that's its nickname. Um, these list all the meteor showers as well. Uh, and then you can see Mercury at elongation again. And there's actually going to be a lunar eclipse that's going to pop up in May. Um, and uh, let's uh, take a brief little look at this eclipse. When you click on the link, it brings up NASA's uh, cool map guide that shows us all about the eclipse. It shows us uh, this is going to be a total eclipse, which will be awesome. That'll be a blood moon. The moon turns blood red. And it also tells us where it'll be visible. So it looks like um, we might be able to see some of it. We'll probably... Uh, let's see, these charts are sometimes hard to read, but uh, it looks like we should be able to, we'll be able to see part of it uh, here uh, at, uh, I believe, sunset, it looks like. Um, I have to check the times, but uh, we'll definitely be posting about that uh, on our Facebook page. So if you haven't liked and subscribed to the Arvin Gottlieb's, Arvin Gottlieb's Planetarium page, be sure to do that. Um, but so there's an eclipse coming up, Sherry, uh, and uh, a annular solar eclipse, which is really cool. Uh, let's um, do, do, do open that up. And this will show us a similar uh, map. Now, this one, unfortunately, is only going to be visible in very northern latitudes. It looks like Santa is going to be able to see it. Um, and an annular eclipse is a little bit different. That's when the moon is far enough away that it can't completely cover up the sun. And so you see sort of a ring of the sun. You can't look at it with the naked eye. Um, so if anybody, any of you are at the North Pole uh, uh, around June, then don't look at the sun without eye protection. Um, but um, it'll still be cool. And it's called annular because uh, that comes from the, the Latin word for ring. Um, so looking onwards, we've got some more new and full moons, got some more elongations and meteor showers. August 2nd, Saturn will be at opposition. This will be the closest it ever gets in its orbit. And so that'll be the best time to look at it. It'll be nice and big on August 19th. I wanna make sure this is, yeah, 2021. <laughs> August 19th uh, will be uh, Jupiter at opposition. So uh, next summer will be, will be another great time to view uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And they'll still be pretty close together because they move pretty slowly around the, around the sun. Uh, and then Neptune, which is not visible to the naked eye, it'll be vis it'll be uh, best observed through a telescope in September. Uh, and so it looks like I'm just going to kind of scroll through this. Got another partial lunar eclipse. Um, I, it appears that there are no major 
uh, conjunctions next year. Just to confirm, uh, let's double check uh, any more conjunctions that'll be coming up. Of course, this calendar only goes to 2020, and I'm just gonna vamp. Uh, let's see. So, yep, so Jupiter um, and Mercury and Saturn were kind of lined up, as I mentioned before. Um, and then there will be some moon conjunctions where the moon lines up with the planet. Sometimes it occludes the planet, so the moon's kind of pop behind the, the or the planets pop behind the moon. Um, and there's some other, like there's a Mars and Uranus conjunction uh, in January, but you know you won't be able to see Uranus except through a very powerful telescope. Um, so no major conjunctions next year um, besides the Mercury ones and the Moon ones, it looks like. Uh, if anybody finds uh, something else and wants to correct me, feel free to. But thanks for asking that question, Sherry. Molly says, is there a trick to looking through a telescope? I live downtown, but I have a balcony and can't see anything. Uh, maybe not the right question for this, so it's okay to not answer. Uh, well, this is definitely the right question, uh, and uh, that's a good question that... Um, uh, I'm glad you asked, Molly. Uh, hopefully you're still watching. But, um, you know, downtown is tough. There is a lot of light pollution here. But some of the most exciting things to see through a telescope, uh, you can see here, even here downtown, like the planets. I've actually set my telescope up in the middle of downtown over on Main and 18th Street. Uh, not this year, obviously, or last year, but in previous years I did that. Uh, and you could, see, uh, you could see the planets pretty clearly. They're nice and bright, and they're able to pass through the light pollution. Um, and uh, I actually set a telescope up just for myself uh, near near downtown for the conjunction. Uh, and even with the downtown light pollution, I was able to see the Orion Nebula and the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, so the trick is to know where you're looking and obviously to know how to operate your telescope. And Molly, if you want to learn more about telescopes, I'd encourage you to check out our May 6th live stream, which you can find on our YouTube channel, um, where I do a deep dive into telescopes and some differences and similarities between them. Uh, and that might uh, help you out with your telescope. Um, and uh, uh, and also I want to mention that even if uh, if a telescope is too intimidating, binoculars are actually really great tools for astronomy as well. They're great uh, starting tools and they're great uh, professional tools too. And they're great because you can just point where you want to look and you don't have to worry about lining them up or whatever. Um, so if you don't have a telescope, Molly, I'd encourage you to think about getting a pair of nice binoculars as a good sort of first step. Uh, and even through a pair of binoculars, you can see um, the clouds on Jupiter, its Galilean moons uh, and the rings on Saturn. So binoculars are a great tool. Rachel says, greetings from Leavenworth. I have a memory like a walnut and had to really think about whether it was Monday night or not when the live stream popped up. Well, I, I, on the one hand, I'm glad that uh, you are so used to our live streams that you know when they're going to happen and you're one of our regular watchers. So um, uh, thanks for tuning in on this special Friday live stream. Uh, and um, Rachel also says, uh, oh, and you know, so Rachel says, and whether live streams really were usually Monday evening or not, they are usually are on Monday, but we've, we've switched it up a little bit over time, so you're not going crazy. Um, Eric is watching from Lenexa, one of our longtime watchers. Thanks for tuning in, Eric. Uh, and uh, and anybody else who wants to let's, let us know where you're watching from, it's always fun. We've had a bunch of people uh, watching from all over the world. We had somebody watching from London last week, which was so crazy, or this week, that was this Monday. I don't know, time is an illusion. Uh, Aaron is watching and says, I read somewhere that there is a triple conjunction this weekend. Is that correct? And if so, what are the chances of being able to see it with the naked eye? And if we can see it, uh, when would be the best time and where should we look? Um, so I kind of already answered that question, Aaron, but if you tuned in late, um, there is a sort of a triple conjunction, um, but it's going to be really hard to spot it. In fact, you probably won't be able to see it. Um, and that is uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury all getting close together. Oh, and you can't see that. Let me go back over here. So this is our Stellarium software where we have the night sky. And this is, um, we're looking at tonight's sunset facing towards the west. And uh, the planets are all here right behind the sun. And that means that as the sun is setting, even when it pops below the horizon, um, you might be able to see them, the, some of the brighter ones like Jupiter, um, but they're gonna be setting really soon after the sun. So um, if we fast forward time here, you'll see that even before most of the stars come out, they will pop out of sight, but there's a chance you might be able to see them. Now Mercury, the third planet here, is very hard to see with the naked eye. So you'll have to get some very good sky conditions away from light pollution. But Aaron, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, Shane is watching. Oh, so great to hear from you, Shane. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, Shane says, Patrick rules with a Z. Uh, and uh, I say that Shane, that Patrick doesn't rule nearly as much as Shane does because Shane has two Zs. 
<laughs> so thanks for watching. Shane, great to hear from you. Eric says, can terraforming really work? For example, on Mars, is its gravity strong enough to hold an atmosphere that might be enhanced? Ooh, that's a great question, Eric. And we've actually talked about this a little bit on a number of different live streams. We did a live stream all about Mars uh, back in uh, August, August 10th. And I talked about um, terraforming uh, during my May 20th live stream where I did fictional universes, where we talked about a couple different universes um, where uh, uh, cultures have terraformed other planets. Um, and I forget which specific universe. Oh, I think I was I was talking about actually a Cowboy Bebop, the um, the uh, the seminal anime series. If you haven't checked that out, one out, it's very cool, very stylish, uh, and it's very short, only one season, so easy to catch up on. Um, but uh, in, in that world, uh, humans have colonized the solar system in the future, uh, and we fly between planets. And uh, Mars is uh, definitely a place that some scientists are thinking about colonizing, even in its current state. But as far as terraforming goes, there's some theories about that. Now, Mars is much smaller than the Earth. It's about half its diameter, but its mass is much lower, so its gravity is lower as well. But it does have enough gravity to hold an atmosphere because uh, it actually currently does have an atmosphere. We can go back over here to uh, Space Engine, and we can go uh, to Mars. And um, we can actually see here on in Space Engine that Mars has an atmosphere. So if I line it up um, with the sun, we can actually sort of peek through the edge. We can even see sort of a... Martian sunrise or sunset here. Um, if I fly close to the edge of the atmosphere. Um, there are also some really great pictures of sunrises and sunsets on Mars, and it's kind of cool because a ooh, a uh, there you can there you can see the atmosphere there. Very very thin, very tenuous, um, but it does indeed have an atmosphere. And uh, um, so uh, it it does have enough uh, gravity to hold an atmosphere. Um, the tricky thing, though, is that Mars, uh, as far as we know, doesn't have a very active core. So its uh, its core is not um, a, as molten as the Earth's. Now, the Earth's molten core, its motion uh, causes the Earth's or creates the Earth's magnetic field, which protects us from solar radiation. And so we think that if we visited Mars, that uh, it could be, excuse me, a little a uh, little tough to live there um, without uh, some serious protection from that radiation. Um, and there are some crazy theories out there, like some people suggest uh, actually rounding up all of our nuclear weapons uh, and firing them at the poles of Mars, which would release a lot of frozen carbon dioxide in the poles of Mars, or you can see one of the ice caps. Um, and over the course of uh, what some scientists estimate to be maybe even less than 100 years, um, again, I'm less familiar with that science, but some scientists claim it could happen very rapidly. But that released carbon dioxide would cause a greenhouse effect, which would effectively trap more heat in that atmosphere. And right now, you couldn't be outside on Mars, um, A, because the atmospheric pressure is so low that um, you would experience very unpleasant effects, but also it's very cold on Mars. Uh, generally because of that thin atmosphere. But if you thick, thicken that atmosphere up, it would get warmer. And it would also get to the point where some scientists think that in the near future, we could actually live on Mars only wearing oxygen masks. It might be thousands of years before there's enough oxygen to breathe on Mars, but um, perhaps someday we could get to that point. But that's a great question, Eric. Not a bunch of people tuning in. That's so awesome. Remember, this is a Q&A live stream. So if you have any questions or comments or just feel like heckling me, feel free to throw those in the comment section. Lance is watching from Kansas City, Missouri. Thanks for tuning in, Lance. So glad you're here with us. Jocelyn says, we are new to all this. My four and, uh, and six-year-old are asking about the laser shows. Are the laser shows children friendly? Uh, they sure are. Uh, and many of them are, I will say. And we offer a number of a different laser show um, options and uh, their their concerts essentially so um, each show will usually be a different artist and um, for, for that we usually recommend that uh, parents and guardians use their best judgment based on uh, the knowledge of the musical uh, the musicians um, so uh, we post information about the musicians and uh, we try to post the playlists uh, which songs are featured as well on our website if you go to unionstation.org but um, uh, for that, uh, they're all uh, all the content is um, appropriate to the artist. I will just say, um, so use your best for judgment there. You know the ch shows we have chosen for uh, the next few weeks uh, for this season because they are matinee shows. We've tried to keep them all child friendly, um, but uh, just keep that in mind. You know uh, the uh, Pink Floyd's "Dark Side of the Moon" uh, is appropriate for children, um, but uh, I will let you decide if your four and six year old would uh, enjoy that show. It's uh, definitely a very cool spectacle of laser light. 
Um, but as far as the music goes, you know, everybody's got different musical tastes. But we do have a lot of great uh, kids show. You know, the Blazer Beatles is perfect for kids. Lasers of Oz is a great kids show as well. And Laser Stranger Things is a little spooky, but it's definitely family friendly. Uh, as well. So we have a lot of different options and we do have kid-friendly laser shows that we offer on occasion. If that's something you'd be interested in, uh, Jocelyn and anybody else watching, then be sure to let us know in the comments section too and we will take that into consideration. Eric says, where can uh, we keep track of upcoming space launches from the Cape? Eric, I'm so glad you asked because that's the other topic that I wanted to bring up. Uh, and I have pulled up a space calendar that I would love to kind of fly through with you guys. Uh, this is from a CNET here, and this is just a great starting point. And this has a list of some exciting upcoming uh, space missions. Uh, for example, SpaceX is going to be testing their next Starship prototype. Uh, SN8 was recently uh, tested, and it was a partial success. Uh, it did reach the altitude it was going towards, uh, but it did explode as it was landing. Uh, or as they say in the rocket business, it had a RUD, a rapid unplanned disassembly. Um, but that is how science goes. There were no humans on the spaceship, uh, and this is part of the test. But SN9, the next test, uh, should be taking place uh, here uh, pretty soon. It could uh, come as early, well, this says as early as today, um, but uh, I don't believe that it is scheduled for today. In fact, uh, let me just check my, the latest um, news on that. Do, 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 do. Uh, trying to get the latest news. Uh, no new news as far as I can tell. Oh, maybe if I type the right letters here. Um, so it looks like uh, it could come as early as this weekend. That is the latest news on SN9. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll try to post something on our Facebook page about that. Um, but the most exciting thing probably is a, not a launch, but a landing. So February 18th uh, is the scheduled landing of NASA's Perseverance rover. And this is the second rover in a series of rovers we've sent in the past decade. The first one was named Curiosity. If you didn't know, by the way, the Curiosity rover was named by a student from Lenexa, Kansas. Uh, so that's very exciting. Um, I believe her name was Clara. And uh, yeah, so uh, good for her. And I believe uh, there was a student from uh, Virginia that named the Perseverance rover. But both these rovers are about the size of a pickup truck. Um, and they have been looking, well, Curiosity has been looking for water and life on Mars. And Perseverance has the same mission. Uh, and it uh, was launched in the summer of last year. Uh, and we talked a lot about probes and rovers, actually, all the way back in April, April 29th. I did a show all about probes and rovers. So if you want to learn, want to learn more about these specific um, uh, probes, then check that out. And of course, our Mars live stream on August 10th, um, we took a deep dive into Curiosity as well. But uh, that launch is uh, scheduled soon. And I want to show you all this. Um, as NASA just updated their website, actually, and they have a really cool uh, animation showing us how it's going to land. And so it actually lands with a sky crane. So there's going to be a, a hovercraft, basically, that'll uh, hover above the surface and it'll lower the uh, Perseverance rover down uh, before dropping it off and then rocketing back out into space. Um, and uh, this is how the Curiosity rover landed. Um, so hopefully the Perseverance rover is just as successful. Their website has a lot of really cool facts about it, um, but I will let you uh, check that out. They even have a 3D visualization that we can explore and pan around. I'll just mention one thing real quick about it if it ever loads. Um, but uh, this uh, sort of mast up here, what looks like sort of its head and eyeball, uh, has a visual camera, but it also has something called a spectrometer. So there's the mast. So you can click it, I'll actually uh, tell you more about it. Um, but uh, this has an instrument called a spectrometer on it, on it, and basically what it does is uh, Curiosity shoots a laser at, or Perseverance as well here, both of these rovers shoot a laser at a rock, and that laser heats up the rock and causes it to spark a little bit. And then a special camera takes a picture of the spark, and essentially the colors that it emits um, will tell us what that rock is made of without the rover having to walk over to it and kind of pick it up and sample it. Um, that is the same uh, principle of science that we use to determine uh, what uh, elements are in distant stars. Uh, and we talk a little bit about spectroscopy when I talk about stellar evolution back on my uh, April 15th live stream. Oh my gosh, very crazy. That was quite a while ago. Um, but uh, so if you want to learn a little, little bit more about how that works, you can check that out. But check out this website for sure. We can post a link to that in uh, the comments section and I'll make sure uh, I get that for uh, us. So if we want to post this link, 
Um, you can go to mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 uh, and you can explore all about Perseverance. And again, uh, that will be landing on February 18th if all goes according to plan. Um, we have uh, the uh, launch of the Boeing Starliner. Now, Boeing is a private company that's working on uh, space technology. SpaceX is already taking astronauts to the International Space Station, but the Boeing Starliner would be another spacecraft that could uh, take NASA's crew and other uh, astronauts to the International Space Station. And so um, it looks like it will be doing an uncrewed orbital flight uh, test uh, that should be happening uh, later this spring. Ooh, this is cool. In March, they're going to be turning on the Large Hadron Collider, a big particle accelerator. Uh, and it has been shut down since December of 2018, actually, quite a while ago. I remember when that happened, but I can't believe it's still been shut down. Um, but they've been looking for the Higgs boson particle, um, which uh, is uh, a very cool particle. We don't have time to get into during this Q&A, um, but uh, it should uh, boot back up, it looks like, uh, here in the spring. Uh, we have a Chinese rover that's going to land on Mars. Exciting that other countries are getting into space exploration. Uh, this is also telling us about that lunar eclipse uh, that'll pop up. And there's also the Ring of Fire eclipse. That's that annular eclipse I mentioned. Um, Ring of Fire is a, a nickname for it. Looks like uh, they're targeting the crewed flight test for the Boeing Starliner in June. So just like last summer, SpaceX's Demo-2 mission took astronauts to the space station as a demonstration of its technology. Uh, Boeing will hopefully do that this summer if all goes according to plan as well. And then uh, on July 22nd, uh, which is my birthday, um, NASA uh, is going to launch a, a mission to crash into an asteroid. So that's very cool. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about asteroids and other minor planets, as they're officially called, our November 9th live stream, we talked all about asteroids and comets and minor planets, as well as some dwarf planets, minus Pluto. Pluto got its own live stream this week, this Monday. In fact, I did a live stream all about Pluto. Uh, so if you love Pluto, check that one out for sure. Um, but uh, I don't actually know a lot about the DART mission, um, but that is very cool. Looks like this is a mission that uh, is heading towards an asteroid called Didymos. Uh, let's see if we can visit Didymos here in Space Engine. Uh, let's fly on over to Didymos and ooh, this asteroid has a moon. That's a fun surprise. Look at that. So there, this uh, mission is going to go explore this asteroid. Uh, which actually has a moon. That's exciting. We talked about asteroid moons. In fact, I did a live stream about my top 10 favorite moons of all time. That was on September 14th. And one of my favorite moons is an asteroid called uh, Dactyl, which has its own moon named Ida. Um, so uh, that's pretty cool. Well, wow, that's cool. I'd love to learn a little, little bit more about the DART mission. NASA has a lot of missions in the work, and I will admit that I don't keep track of them as well as I should. Um, but this is, uh, oh, it's the double asteroid redirection test. Okay, so um, one of the ideas for protecting the Earth from uh, near-Earth objects, asteroids that could crash into us, is to redirect them, to move them out of the way. And there are a lot of uh, theories for how to do that. Um, uh, in fact, if you want to learn more about how uh, we think we can do that, I did a live stream about it. Um, and that would be uh, my live stream on, do, 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 uh, where is it? Uh, um, ah, that is my October 30, no, sorry, August 31st live stream, all about space surprises. Surprises from space like asteroids uh, on their way to impact us. And so I talk about in that live stream um, how to redirect an asteroid. And one idea is to crash a spacecraft into it to kind of push it a little bit. And if you push the asteroid uh, when it's far enough away, then even if you push it just a tiny bit, then its trajectory could move out of the path of the Earth. So they're going to test that out um, and uh, we will see um, how that goes. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, that uh, impact probably won't happen uh, for quite a while, but the launch uh, will be on my birthday. So that's exciting. Um, so uh, there's a lot of other uh, upcoming missions, and just in the interest of time, I'm going to speed through them. We go through them. We've got a spacecraft from the European Space Agency flying by Mercury. We've got uh, a uh, launch of another NASA astro uh, asteroid mission called Lucy, which will attempt to visit eight asteroids over 10 years. Um, fingers crossed, cross your fingers and toes, folks, because allegedly NASA's James Webb P Space Telescope will launch, and this is a space telescope that has been in the works for decades. And it was supposed to launch um, about four years ago, I believe. Uh, so it is allegedly going to launch this year. That is the plan, if there are no more delays. Um, it is done being built, so 
Oh, fuck. Cross your fingers. We did a, a live stream all about taste space telescopes. That was actually on James Webb's birthday. Uh, and that was on October 5th. So if you want to learn more about the James Webb Space Tel Telescope, check out that live stream. But cross your fingers, folks. Let's hope it launches. Um, and then uh, let us see. There will be a, an eclipse in Antarctica. Uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, a, a some test launches of NASA's Artemis program, which they plan to bring astronauts back to the moon uh, in a few years. 2024 is their target goal. All right, so we got a lot of comments to catch up on. Uh, David, one of our longtime watchers, uh, says, when is the next live stream? Thanks for asking that, David. Uh, and that is a valid question since this one is a bit unusual. Uh, we have changed our schedule a little bit and we are going to take next Monday off since we're doing this Q&A live stream. So the next official live stream is scheduled for January 18th, okay? That'll be uh, the Monday following next. Uh, and for that, I'll just spoil it right now. We're going to do um, Hollywood Astronomy 2, Electric Boogaloo. We are going to revisit our The Wonderful World of movies and talk about some movies I missed in that live stream. Uh, one of the biggest uh, requests was The Martian, so we're going to talk about The Martian. And if you have any other suggestions uh, for movies that you'd like us to hit that talk about space uh, and you'd like to learn if they uh, are, had some truth to them or not, then uh, post in the comments, let us know what movies you're interested in, but that will be our next live stream. And that is again scheduled for January 18th. We're going to skip next Monday. I'm going to take some time off, folks. Um, all right, uh, Tammy, another one of our longtime watchers and top fans, says, Hello for Iowa again. Fun and so informative as always. Well, thank you, Tammy. And you joining us is as fun and special as always as well. So thanks for watching, Tammy. Susan says, we are watching from downtown KC. Awesome, Susan. Uh, hello. I'm watching from, I'm watching and presenting from downtown KC as well. Uh, Tasha's tuning in again. Thanks for watching, Tasha. Tasha says, I think my three-year-old would really like the planetarium. What is the best show for kids? Thanks for asking that, Tasha. And I bet they would. And we have a lot of really great shows that are good for kids. Um, right now on our schedule, we've got uh, two awesome shows that I'd recommend. Uh, for our very little ones, we have uh, One World, One Sky, Big Birds Adventure, uh, which is a Sesame Street program that was produced by Sesame Street and the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, one of the uh, planetarium royalty, I would I say, in the planetarium biz. Uh, but that is a great short 25-minute Sesame Street program all about the night sky, introducing some really great topics uh, uh, to our little ones, our early learners about space. And then uh, for a little step up above that, um, if we have any... Uh, kids in the audience who are fans of the Magic Treehouse series, a uh, really awesome book series. We have a Magic Treehouse show called Magic Treehouse Space Mission, and that's actually not based on one of the books, although it is uh, written by the book creators. Um, and it is a brand new mission that Jack and Annie go on to uh, explore space and learn about it. So that's a great one to check out. And then I always recommend our star tour as well. If you have uh, somebody who just loves looking at the stars, our live program is great for all ages. And because it's live, it can be catered to our, to our audience. So if we have a certain people in our audience, we'll try to make it good for them as well. So we have a lot of little ones who enjoy the live star tour. Uh, plus, it's very calming uh, with some great chill background music and uh, chill commentary. And so if you want to take a nap, that's a great opportunity for, as well. But thanks for asking, Tasha. And I really hope you'll come by the planetarium. It'd be great to see you. Molly says, I have uh, a, a telescope, but I can't see through it. Maybe a better starter one you can recommend. So it looks like... Um, Let's see. You have uh, your you posted the model a G Skyer. Okay, G Skyer telescope. I'm not familiar with this specific brand, Molly, um, but um, you're asking if I can recommend a better starter one, uh, and um, I wouldn't get too discouraged by this telescope. Um, I would recommend uh, going on YouTube and doing a search for uh, your specific telescope and uh, see if there are any, is anybody who made, who's made a video about that specific one that may be able to tell you that, oh, it's just one little dial to turn and then then suddenly it'll all work. Because uh, even I'm looking at uh, this telescope here uh, on, on Amazon and I think it be, would be a great starter telescope. So um, assuming that nothing's broken with it, it could be a great uh, resource uh, without having to get a new one. Um, I uh, Besides that though, to answer your question, um, uh, there are a lot of great brands out there. Uh, Celestron and Orion are kind of the big names. Um, I don't have any particular brand loyalty, uh, and uh, neither of them are sponsoring this video. Although, if any of them do, feel free to give us a call um, if they want to. But uh, my telescope, personal is an, one, is an Orion telescope, um, but uh, they're all really great. I've used Celestrons a lot as well. Um, I would recommend generally, though, that a reflecting telescope is a great one to start with, um, which uses a mirror. They're also very light, and they're a little bit easier to maintain, um, so that could be a great start. And then Molly says, um, 
uh, one, oh, so you want one that you can take uh, pictures uh, from your phone. Any telescope uh, should be able to work, and you can get a special mount that will uh, help uh, line your phone up with that. Um, so, uh, great question, Molly. Uh, David says, I'm watching from Colorado Springs, USA. Thanks for tuning in, David. Lance uh, says, as a teen, I had the Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon. I would get in trouble for playing it so loud. Well, if you come to the planetarium and see our laser show version of it, uh, then you will not get in trouble because we will be blasting it on full blast there as well, complete with smoke effects and lasers shining over your heads in 3D. It's a very cool show. I would highly recommend it. Uh, and it is a pretty trippy. James and Donna say they're watching from KCK. Love your videos. Well, thanks for watching, James and Donna. It means a lot to me that uh, you guys are tuning in and that you are enjoying our programs. Jocelyn says, thank you. Good info on the laser shows. You're welcome, Jocelyn. So glad I could answer your question. Roxy says, hello from KC Mo. Uh, David, oh, hello, Roxy. Thanks for watching. And David uh, asks, what programs, uh, what or who programs the laser concerts? Does Union Station have a specialist who designs the shows um, or is uh, the content produced elsewhere? That's a great question, David. Um, and uh, we uh, right now we don't produce our own shows. Uh, they're produced by um, uh, the uh, uh, the company that uh, our laser system is run through. Uh, they're a company called Laser Fantasy, and there are a number of different laser companies that produce shows. Um, but we chose Laser Fantasy, I'll just say, because we really like the shows that they produce. We think they're really cool and really creative and uh, really cutting edge. A lot of really cool modern shows. The Laser Stranger Things show we got almost immediately after the the season came out. Um, and so, you know, that was really relevant and really exciting that people could see that show that everybody was talking about um, in laser form. Um, so, uh, but we do have the capability to make them ourselves. And I'll say, David, sometime in the future, hopefully, as things get back to normal, um, I would love to add that to our repertoire of things that we say we produce in-house. Right now, we produce our live star tour in-house. We produce these live streams as well in-house. And we do other special programs like um, Harry Potter uh, um, uh, astronomy and uh, special events like eclipses and the anniversary of Apollo. We do special programs for those at the planetarium as well. I will say that we um, we are planning uh, some sort of event uh, for the uh, landing of the Perseverance rover. Um, details will be coming. Just be sure you like and subscribe to the Arvin Gottlieb Planetarium's Facebook page as well as the Union Station Facebook page um, for information about that as we figure out all the details to make sure that it is as safe and good for everybody as possible. Um, so just as a sidebar there. But great question, David. Um, and that is the answer. Laser fantasy. Eric says, when things get warmer, will Science City have live star viewing nights for the public? And yeah, Eric, uh, certainly, as soon as, uh, as soon as it is possible, I cannot wait to set my telescope up again and invite a big group of people to come see something exciting in the sky. Um, who knows, maybe by the time uh, we get to that, um, that uh, total eclipse, a total lunar eclipse in May, fingers crossed that things are uh, to a point where we can safely gather and we can do that because I would love to do a big viewing event for that. That would be so much fun. And again, be sure you subscribe to the Planetarium's Facebook page uh, for news about that. Lance says, uh, that's one hot laser, uh, in reference to the Perseverance laser spectrometer, I assume. Uh, let's not all freak out if we see a pic of a Martian lighting a cigarette with it. Uh, that would be very alarming, uh, if not slightly entertaining. Uh, but that's a very funny, funny thought, Lance. Uh, Rachel says, uh, let's see, uh, in a reference to, uh, I, um, I believe, uh, hmm, I, I think it, I, I apologize, I uh, what we were talking about before, but Rachel says, oh, that would be cool. I would totally take my kid. When I was a younger, I lived in California at the Griffith, Griffith, Griffith Observatory and did stuff like that. And it was so much fun, and I always learned a bunch uh, in reference, I assume, to uh, seeing one of our shows. So, yeah, definitely check us out. I, I would love to go to the Griffith Observatory. That's on my bucket list. I've actually never been uh, there before. David says, my favorite moon is the Death Star. That's no moon. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, the Death Star is a great moon. Lance says, oh boy, I love I loved the science, but let's hope they don't push that asteroid the wrong way. <laughs> In reference to uh, that, um, that asteroid uh, nudging mission. Uh, what was that mission called again? Uh, that was the... Doot, 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 doot. Uh, the DART mission. That's such a funny acronym. Of course, NASA loves their acronyms, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, let's hope they don't push that asteroid the wrong way. Lance says, could it come back and meet us years later if that were to happen? But that's a great thought, actually. And uh, Lance, it sure could. You know, we try to be as careful as possible, but there's only so much we can calculate when it comes to um, orbital mechanics. We can predict the motion of objects to a certain degree, but at a certain point, chaos takes over and 
if that asteroid, you know, in a hundred years passes by another asteroid that we didn't predict was going to pass by it and it nudged it back the other direction, who knows? So the trick is just to pay as close attention to things that are close by as possible. Um, but uh, it definitely could. That's definitely possible. Uh, Eric says that Granny wants to know uh, what we hope to accomplish by going back to the moon. And uh, Granny, that is a great question. That is a wonderful question because um, that's a question that people often ask. Uh, you know, why are we thinking about going back to the moon? And in general, why are we spending money on exploring space or going back to the moon or exploring beyond the moon, like going to Mars? Um, and I will say that we touched on this topic in great detail during my Thanksgiving live stream, and that was on November 23rd, where I talked about all the reasons we should be thankful for space exploration. And we talk a lot about uh, in that live stream about, you know, why uh, we spend money on going to space. And we also talk about how there's a lot of misconceptions about how much we spend on space. A lot of people think we spend more than we do. And really, uh, space exploration is a very tiny line item on our, on our uh, annual budget every year. So... The first part, the answer I would say is that we don't really spend that much money on space, but even the money we do spend, why do we go to other places? And, um, you know, uh, there are a lot of answers. For one, we, uh, we, you know, love to explore. If it weren't for the spirit of exploration, then none of us would be living here in the United States today. Um, and, you know, whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, I'll let you debate in the comments. But um, <laughs> it's, it is true that uh, the, the people in uh, Europe who you know, were uh, itching to explore the world. They uh, they explored, and even before that, you know, uh, the peoples who migrated uh, throughout the world and and who uh, who left Africa to explore Europe and who walked across the land bridge uh, through Alaska to North America, um, or people who built boats and explored uh, the Pacific Islands and got to Australia and New Zealand. You know, they just went because it was there. They wanted to explore. They wanted to see what was out there. And uh, now we have a whole world uh, that we've explored. Um, so that's a big part of it, just the spirit of exploration. You know, another part of it is that um, by exploring these other places, we learn more about our home. Because the moon is made out of similar similar materials as the Earth, then uh, the more we learn about the moon, the more we learn about the Earth. And uh, the moon has, because it doesn't have an atmosphere, it doesn't have any erosion or weather, uh, it's very preserved. So by learning about the moon, we can actually learn about our early solar system. We can sort of peer back in time and learn about how the Earth formed. Uh, so it expands our knowledge of science. Exploring beyond there, though, going to Mars, you know, um, we want to uh, we want to colonize other planets because you know right now we kind of have all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, we are all living here on Earth. Every human is living on Earth except for a few people up in the International Space Station. So if anything were to happen to the Earth, whether it was our fault or otherwise, um, we are kind of alone. And so uh, by making sure that there's sort of a backup on another planet, um, that ensures that humanity survives. So that's a, another big reason why we want to explore and why we want to colonize other other places. Um, so uh, Amber is, uh, oh, dude, what, real quick, um, we, it looks like we're winding down in our comments, which is great. We've been live streaming for about 45 minutes, which is awesome. Uh, but if you do have any last second questions or comments, be sure to put those in the comment section because uh, we will be wrapping up here in the next five minutes. Uh, Amber says, have you been to a NASA facility or have you been to the NASA facility in Houston, Texas? I When I was a kid, it was really cool. Uh, and I have, yeah, I've been there a, a number of times. And actually I went there uh, recently, well, it feels like recently, but I think it was in 2013. Um, but I went to um, the uh, the space educate or the uh, space exploration educators conference. I think that's what the acronym is. NASA loves their acronyms, but it's a it's an annual conference for teachers um, that NASA hosts all about uh, education for uh, you know space education. I'm not sure if they still host it actually. I mean they probably didn't host it for the past couple of years, but um, uh, but anyway uh, they, they hosted that conference that year. Uh, in Houston, um, and uh, they have a virtual conference this year, February 4th through 6th, so you can check that out. Um, but yeah, you know, NASA has a lot of really amazing facilities. Uh, in fact, I'm going to just, uh, she may not be watching, but um, one of my uh, former coworkers, Jordan, uh, who you may have seen on our uh, Facebook pages, she did a bunch of great content last year uh, with Science on a Sphere. Uh, she uh, is uh, now working for NASA at uh, one of the facilities. Uh, and there are a number of facilities around the country. There are some in Florida. There's some uh, in Washington, D.C. There's some in California. Uh, so there are a lot of places all around. But uh, everybody give a, a shout out to Jordan in the comments for landing a really cool NASA job because that's awesome. Uh, Patience says, uh, no cozy, shout out to the, uh, oh, no koozie. I know, I'm, I've, I usually have a koozie, don't I? I'm, I'm rocking the, the coffee cup today um, with this lovely 
uh, uh, planet pattern, courtesy of my ex-girlfriend. So shout out Shelly, thanks for this gift a couple of years ago. Um, but, uh, and uh, the bird sidekick, you know, we're nearing the end of the stream. So let's see if Phoebe wants to join us. Um, come here, come here. He was chewing on something, but I'm sure she'll find something on my shirt to chew on. Here she is, Phoebe. Phoebe the Gala. It was National Bird Day this week. Did you see that? You got your own post on our Facebook page. How exciting. And so thanks for reminding me, Patience, for bringing uh, my sidekick back out. Again, this is Phoebe for nobody, for anybody who's uh, not met her. Um, she is a rose-breasted cockatoo, or Gala, as they say in Australia. And she is, uh, she's just a baby. She's a couple months old. Um, Rachel says, okay, I have a random question for you. What's your favorite representation of space in fiction? That's an awesome question, Rachel. I love that question. Ah, uh, oof, that's a really good question. My favorite representation of space. Um, and I'll probably answer in a bunch of different ways in a roundabout way, but, um, I love, uh, Star Trek's representation of space in some ways because it's so hopeful, you know, it, it thinks about the world uniting and, um, uh, every uh, a lot of different cultures coming together to explore space, and I really like that that sort of uh, utopic th thought of the future of that we could someday get a away from our petty differences and unite to uh, explore the universe. Um, so I like that a lot. Um, you know, it, it's a little uh, grimy and uh, a little uh, full of mercenaries, but the Cowboy Bebop universe is very cool. I like the thought of humanity just living uh, among the stars throughout the solar system. Um, but I think my all-time favorite um, might be uh, Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. Uh, and these are this is sort of a retro-futuristic idea of space. This is before we really started exploring space uh, seriously. And so um, when Isaac Asimov wrote this series of books, which takes place in a galaxy conquered by humanity uh, tens of thousands of years in the future, um, he imagined a, a version of space travel very different than the one uh, we ended up with. And so I really just love retrofuturism because um, it's kind of cool to think about these these futures that won't exist because, you know, t technology has gone in a different way. But, you know, for example, all of his spaceships are nuclear powered in his series, which today doesn't really make sense. Um, uh, or, it, you know, and not exactly in the same way. But I just like that idea of like a, an, an imagined different future. Um, so that's a really great question, Rachel. I'm glad you asked that. Lance says, I would uh, hate to live in a world that didn't have the spirit of exploration here on Earth and abroad. That's right, Lance. I totally agree because uh, think of all the cool things that we have found by exploring the world. Uh, Shane says, where are you going for vacation, Patricio? Are you bringing your scope? Uh, that is a great question, Shane. Where am I going for vacation this year? I haven't really decided. Who knows? Travel is so, so weird this year. Um, but... Uh, I'm not sure. You know, uh, I my I have some tentative plans, hopefully, to go out west, uh, depending on how things go this year. Um, and I would love to find some really, really dark skies. There are some amazing dark skies out there. Um, it has been uh, over 10 years now since I've had a truly dark sky empty of uh, light pollution. Last time I went on a long backpacking trip. So I'd like to do that. Maybe go to the Grand Canyon. Who knows? I'd also love to see uh, the sunset over the ocean. Uh, which I've never seen. I've never been to the Pacific Ocean, so I might check that out. So great question, Shane. And thanks again for watching. It's great to hear from you. Uh, Lauren says, oh, way to go, Jordan. Yeah, shout out to Jordan. She rocks. Way to go landing a NASA job. Uh, Rachel, says, uh, Rachel says, Jordan is living the dream with that NASA job. Exactly. Um, and uh, Stephanie says, love the bird. Uh, and Phoebe says uh, that she loves you back. You want to give a kiss? No? You want to give a kiss? No, okay. Well, <laughs> she's not sure, um, but uh, I'm sure she she's happy you're watching, Stephanie. <laughs> uh, Lance says, "Tweet, tweet, little cutie." Yeah, tweet. Well, it's it's tweeting now, but earlier today it was screeching. Um, but that's okay. That's what birds do. We're still learning. Yeah, scratch, scratch. I think she's learning to talk too. Um, and uh, Amber says, will this be on the YouTube channel? My friend's computer died. Oh no, it will for sure be on the YouTube channel. In fact, we'll post a link to our YouTube channel. We've got a playlist of all of our past live streams. And I think unless there are no more questions, that is a great place to end our stream. So Amber, thanks for asking that, uh, for wrapping us up. And everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in to this live stream. This uh, went really well. Wasn't sure how many people would watch on this Friday night, but um, hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, this little Q&A. 
I've got plans uh, for uh, some really exciting content coming up. Like I said, the next live stream will be on the 18th of January. We're skipping next Monday, but we'll be back uh, with a vengeance um, for our, woo, that was that was your own feather. She, she fluffed and then a feather flew up and then it freaked her out. You're just a baby, aren't you? Um, but uh, so on, on January 18th, we'll be doing a live stream uh, on Hollywood Astronomy. It'll be the sequel, Hollywood Astronomy 2, Electric Boogaloo. We'll be able to take a deep dive into more movies and how they do with space, all the good and bad in space astronomy. The Martian's on the list, and if you have other movie recommendations, be sure to post them in the comments. Morgan says, I just joined. I love your bird. Well, thanks for joining, Morgan. And don't forget, you can watch all of our past live streams on our YouTube channel or this one if you want to rewatch and check it out. Uh, but so glad that you tuned in just in time to uh, see Phoebe here. And David said, China's The Wandering Earth had a similar idea of humanity uniting for the survival of mankind. Uh, and uh, David posts uh, a review of the movie. Uh, and uh, yeah, we can bring that up. In fact, I, I've seen previews of it and maybe I'll have to watch it as homework, um, but it looks interesting. All I know is that um, they strap rocket engines to the planet planet Earth to move it around in space, which seems crazy, but uh, I'll have to watch the movie and see if there's some science to it, because who knows? Uh, maybe they actually got it right. But David, thanks for uh, suggesting that. We'll bring that in there. Uh, Eric chiming in saying, great show, love these live streams. Thanks again for watching, Eric. Uh, and thanks to everyone else for tuning in once again. We're going to wrap this up. I have been your planetarium specialist, Patrick Hess, and this is my assistant, Phoebe. We are so glad you joined us, and we will not see you next Monday as we take the day off, but we will see you the following Monday on January 18th. Uh, but for now, I hope you all have a great week, a uh, great weekend, uh, and a great start of the year. It's been a crazy year uh, already, even though it's a couple days in, but I'm sure things will look up as the year goes on. So we'll see you guys next time. Have a great night.